switch mode, it says. Is, that, is this on? All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Judy, how are you? Nice to see you. Good beer, you all. Uh, good afternoon. We have a lot uh, to get caught up on. Pat Callahan will not, um, will not uh, speak to me unless I... You were, you were leaving me a note, I thought. Okay. Sorry? Okay, thank you. Um, Pat Callahan will not speak to me unless I say that um, uh, he has established and we've established a new website for folks who want to donate uh, personal protective equipment, and God knows we need it. Uh, email, rather. Uh, and that is PPE donations at njsp.org. PPE donations at njsp.org. Mahan, may I ask, can we add that from going forward to this uh, uh, placard? So, and that's for PPE donations. Um, I assume this is Dr. Bresnitz. Uh, I want to give him a particular shout out. He's with us today. He's the former state epidemiologist. He's joined us as an advisor. Dr. Bresnitz, we can't thank you enough for your help. Um, I know you've got your eyes clearly focused on Dr. Tan, who's now in your former seat. So, uh, yeah, devil, it's, listen, uh, uh, you, 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 you've done well, as they say. So thank you so much for being with us today. I'm honored uh, to be with, uh, as usual, a distinguished group. The health team to my right, the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of Health, Judy Persichelli. To her right, Assistant Commissioner Chris Newworth, and to his right is the aforementioned Dr. Christina Tan, who is our state's epidemiologist. Immediately to my left, I don't know where we'd be without him, the Attorney General Gerbier Graywall. To his left, a, a, another guy who's indispensable, the Director of Homeland Security, Jared Maples. And to his left, the aforementioned Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan. Uh, let's get right at it. I want to thank the overwhelming number of New Jerseyans who are heeding our call to stay home unless they are needed for our frontline response efforts. I cannot say it enough. Social distancing works and slowing the spread of COVID-19 only happens if we take steps to protect ourselves and others. So when we hear of people hosting parties or other ga gatherings, we will not take it lightly. We will ask law enforcement to cite them for their irresponsible behavior, and the Attorney General uh, will have more on that in a few minutes. And before I continue, to all school districts, we have received your questions, we continue to receive them, and we need you to continue your food service operations and to provide meals to the students who need them. The reality is that schools will likely, we've not made an official decision, but they were overwhelmingly likely remain closed for a long and extended period of time, and we must ensure that every student is taken care of. There is an enormous amount going on, as you can imagine. We had our pre-call earlier. Um, I've been on with members of Congress to try to get a sense of where things stand, uh, uh, both on the House side, but frankly, even more importantly, on the Senate side, Senator Menendez and I had a conversation uh, we've been in touch with uh, Minority Leader Schumer's office. Um, we continue to watch that very, very closely. And among other things, to beat uh, the drum again, we are desperate for direct state cash assistance. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but uh, Governor Cuomo, Governor Wolf, Governor Lamont, and I believe our region alone is in need of something like $100 billion. And that is essential. Again, think of this. We are at the front lines. We're at the point of attack with folks who are sick uh, and need health care, uh, in some cases hospitalization, with workers who have lost their jobs, with small businesses in particular, businesses of all shapes and sizes that have impacted. Um, we need to continue to, to do our job, and in order to do so, we need the federal government to come in with a big bucket of money to help us al allow us to continue to do that. Um, and so uh, we are very anxious to see where the congressional road takes us. We have been weighing in aggressively, not just with our own delegation, but beyond as well as with other governors. Uh, we are doing this at noon today because we have a video call at 2 p.m. with the president, vice president, and their teams. Uh, that's the weekly Monday call. Again, I think we flipped it uh, today. I just uh, got off a call 
with the executive board of the AFL-CIO in New Jersey, uh, both to update our brothers and sisters in labor uh, as to the corona fight, as well as to take some questions. As you all likely know, the AFL-CIO is a very broad labor umbrella and it includes everything from bricklayers to retail workers to firefighters and everyone in between, educators, etc. So I want to give them a big shout out. They gave me the opportunity in one compact uh, gathering by telephone to give a sense of, of where we are. I just got off a one-on-one -on -one call with President Trump, uh, thanked him for help and pleaded on three different fronts. Uh, number one, to reiterate the need for personal protective equipment. And I said to the president uh, on, on the phone with just the two of us, as I've said in our video gatherings, we understand that the Lord helps those that help themselves. Uh, and so we're doing everything we can in New Jersey, led by the likes of Judy and her team and Pat and others uh, who are turning over literally every stone. I, I mentioned the website. I'll repeat it, ppedonations at njsp.org. NJSP as in New Jersey State Police, um, uh, but we still need a slug of support from the federal uh, government. We got a fraction of our ask. We need a lot more, uh, and we're hearing this all over the state. Um, uh, secondly, I reiterated that I had hoped the con congressional road would lead toward a result with a big chunk of direct cash assistance for states. That's too early to know where that comes out. Yeah, the president did indicate and acknowledge that he knows there was support for that from both sides of the aisle, and we did hear that at the end of the week and over the weekend. Uh, red and blue states agree on this. And then thirdly, uh, after having gotten off a call with Judy and, and actually this entire team up here, I, I thanked the president for the particular support out of FEMA Region 2, um, which, by the way, includes our t uh, two of our testing sites, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I asked him for his support uh, for four pop-up field hospitals uh, that FEMA Region 2 would be the primary federal interface with. The president, to his credit, said he would support that and that I should relay that on to FEMA Region 2 leadership, which we have, uh, in the intervening very few minutes between that call and being here, we have done that. Uh, Judy will go through some uh, either today or in the coming days as to exactly how we see capacity uh, over the next number of weeks. But we are clearly going to need these field hospitals. Um, and uh, I want to thank again FEMA Region 2 for their partnership as well as President Trump personally uh, for his support of that. Um, since our briefing yesterday, 935 additional positive cases have been identified. That brings our statewide total, Judy, I believe, to 2,844. And uh, as usual, uh, Judy will go through the, some of the details associated with that. As I have said, as we have said, this increase is not a surprise, nor is it necessarily a cause for great alarm to us seated up here. Uh, there's clearly community spread going on, and when Judy goes through some of the concentrations by county, you'll see that. Uh, but there's also a lot more testing going on. Uh, and we've said all along, as the testing regime expands, um, we're going to see these numbers go up in a big way. And we've been saying now for many days, these will go into the many thousands. Um, and on the one hand, folks, are, I'm sure we'll have a reaction, oh, my Lord, that's a lot of positives. On the other hand, the more data we have at our disposal, the better and more equipped we are to be able to break the back of this virus. Um, as we begin, as I said, more rigorous collections statewide, we are act in actuality getting a clearer and better sense of how far the coronavirus has already spread. We expect, as I said, these numbers to continue to rise as more testing sites open. And I'm going to say something I've actually, I'm out over my skis and I don't ski, so bear with me on this one. Some of today's numbers may already include early results from Bergen Community College, or we don't know yet. We don't know yet. So I'm going to use the word may still. Um, we just got, by the way, we're doing this two hours earlier than normal. And again, want to re remind you of two things. The earlier we do it, the less uh, comfortable or insight we have as to the data. 
And secondly, we continue to have the gap between what the Department of Health knows in terms of the demographics of the people they test versus the increasing scaled operations by the private sector firms. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep the words in my remarks uh, as prepared, which is today's numbers may include early results from Friday's tests at Bergen Community College. And by the way, in the coming days, we know we'll be adding results not just from there, but from the PNC Arts Banks Arts Center as well as county sites. Additionally, Homeland Security Director Jared Maples, too, to my left in coordination with Commissioner, Commissioner Persa Kelly, to my immediate right, today directed all private labs conducting COVID-19 tests to report their results directly to the Department of Health. This centralization of data is critical for us to get testing results in real time so we can make further decisions on mitigation in real time. And again, there is that gap that exists. At one level, it's understandable, but at a certain point, uh, it can't go on. We need that information. So I want to thank the director and the commissioner for that. Sadly, we have seven more COVID-19 related deaths to report. And as always, these families, these lost souls are in our prayers. God bless each and every one of them. Again, Judy will provide not only more color on the positive cases, but also on these fatalities. I alluded to this this morning, the drive-through testing site at the PNC Bank Arts Center opened at 8 a.m. and it quickly hit capacity. It will reopen at 8 a.m. tomorrow and every day, assuming we have the supplies and the manpower, and will remain open until daily capacity is met. We urge everyone to please be patient, and we know this has required patience. We've seen the stories, we've heard them directly from folks who have waited in, in long lines. And please ask you to follow the directions of state and local law enforcement, as well as the brave women and men of the New Jersey National Guard who are on site. Again, I thank each and every one of them, and I express our tremendous gratitude again to FEMA Region 2 for their partnership in getting this site open as they did with the site of Bergen Community College, and also to the Department of Health's teams and all the medical personnel on site. Additionally, and I cannot stress this enough, again, you're not hearing this for the first time, if you are not exhibiting symptoms, if you do not show signs of respiratory illness, you will not be tested. We know there is pent-up demand. We get that. We understand that. And we are working as best we can to ensure that the testing resources we have available to us are properly distributed and preserved for residents who are exhibiting symptoms and need to be tested. So please help us out there. Also, I mentioned Union County over the weekend. I want to mention that Hudson County has announced the opening of a testing site for its residents and first responders at Hudson Regional Hospital in Secaucus. I just got a text as I walked in from the CEO of that hospital. This site is open by appointment only to individuals exhibiting systems of respiratory illness. And if you need testing, this is for the Hudson County site, please call 201-388-1097. Again, 201-388-1097. Again, you must be either a Hudson County resident or a first responder working in the county, and you must be exhibiting symptoms. And again, you must call on that particular site for an appointment. Do not just show up. I want to thank um, uh, the leadership of Hudson County, led by County Executive, one of the greats, Tom DeGeese, the leadership of Hudson County, or Hudson Regional Hospital, pardon me, and Secaucus Mayor Mike Ganelli and their teams for their partnerships and efforts. Before I go on on testing, uh, in a world of limited resources and manpower, we're going to be, and, and by the way, we've been as aggressive on testing as any American state. Uh, we've been as uh, out there uh, expanding, as we predicted, testing uh, dramatically. We are going to come to a moment sooner than later, I would guess, uh, as it relates to manpower, healthcare workers in particular, uh, PPE the actual specimen collecting equipment that is needed to take the intake. Um, we're going to come to sort of forks in the road between, I'm, I'm again, a, a beyond my pay grade, Commissioner, but between uh, resources and manpower dedicated to testing versus resources and manpower dedicated to care. 
uh, and that's a balance we're going to have to get right. Uh, and as much as we want to continue to be a leader in testing in our country, the fact of the matter is in a limited uh, resource world, in a limited manpower world, we may have to tilt the machine uh, more toward the care side. As Attorney General uh, Graywall has announced today, this morning, I believe, certain low-level offenders will be released. Was that this morning, Gabriel? The process has started. The process has started this morning. Um, offender, uh, low -level, certain low-level offenders will be released from county jails to prevent the spread of coronavirus within our corrections system. This is a prudent measure, and all efforts have been made to ensure public safety. The Attorney General will address this shortly. I don't know that there's any other American state that's done this. We got a lot of questions over the weekend on it, uh, and I applaud the Attorney General for beginning that process. More on that in a moment. Additionally, this morning I signed an executive order suspending all elective surgeries or invasive procedures, both medical and dental, effective at 5 p.m. this Friday, March 27. 5 p.m. this Friday, March 27. No operation that can be safely delayed as determined by a patient's doctor or dentist will be performed after this time and until further notice. We must take this step, and it doesn't bring us joy to take this step, but we have to, to lessen the burden on our health care system and to preserve especially the personal protective gear that our medical responders need, and which, as we know, is in short supply, not just in New Jersey, but nationally. I am pleased that the New Jersey Hospital Association, in partnership with the Department of Health, the New Jersey State Police, and the Office of Emergency Management, or as we call it, OEM, will be centralizing, effective, I think, immediately, the efforts uh, to, I believe this is immediate, to manage our PPE supplies. OEM at The Rock, uh, where I'm headed after this for the video uh, call with the President and Vice President, um, OEM will be coordinating with the Hospital Association to maintain an ongoing inventory of statewide PPE supplies to ensure that the individual needs of hospitals are and first responders are pro being properly and efficiently fulfilled. I thank our health care systems for their partnership in sharing their inventory and for their cooperation. As I've said many times, we are all in this together, and that doesn't just mean all 9 million of us as residents but also our various health care networks. So thank you to each and every one of them. And again, Kevin Slavin and I spoke about this over the weekend, and I want to give him, as its chair of the association, a particular shout-out. I know you'd want to add Kathy Bennett to that list as well. The Diabetes Foundation has also opened a hotline for individuals living with all types of diabetes to receive a free backup emergency kit. Anyone needing an emergency backup kit can apply to receive one by visiting diabetesfoundationinc.org. That's diabetesfoundationinc.org or calling 973-849-5234. Again, diabetesfoundationinc.org and 973-849-5234. And I thank both the Diabetes Foundation and as well as its corporate partners. Uh, and again, the, the, the signs of corporate goodwill are everywhere. In this case, Becton Dickinson, Novo Nordisk, Ascensia Diabetes Care, Arcre, List Pharmacy, and Insera ShopRite Supermarkets for their efforts. I also had a very good call with the president of a, my former employer, Goldman Sachs, who maintains a significant presence in Jersey, presence in Jersey City, uh, and they've got some important equipment and supplies they're looking to donate. I, I give them a shout out as well. Again, it's all about our entire New Jersey families. Also, while we know that many New Jersey uh, residents are currently working from home, we are definitely aware of those who are currently out of work because of our efforts to promote social distancing. And again, we, we, we were presented with two choices from the get-go. Again, we started meeting on this in January. On the one hand, let this virus run its course, no social distancing. Ultimately, a lot of people will lose their lives and a lot of sick people and our economy will be cratered. That's one choice. The other choice is to get out ahead of this as best we can to aggressively enforce, implement and enforce social distancing. Uh, we will take short-term enormous economic pain 
but we are ripping the bandage off, as it were, and God willing, as a result, lessening the amount of fatalities and sickness at the end of the day. We chose affirmatively, unanimously to take door number two, and we continue to do that, but that does not come without a price, and we understand that. Now, for those who are out of work, I want to make sure they're, that they are listening in particular. At the same time, critical businesses remain open, and some of them are desperately seeking people to help them on the front lines of our response. By our tally, there are more than 8,000 available jobs, including grocery workers, warehouse, and manufacturing distribution personnel, and many others. The Department of Labor and the Economic Development Authority have partnered to create a single page where anyone willing to pitch in and work to help us respond to this emergency can find and apply for one of those jobs. That site is live and available through a link on our information portal. Again, I want to repeat this. This is the sort of central repository, covid19.nj.gov, covid19.nj.gov. Finally, I know that many New Jerseyans have been reaching out to state offices for answers to questions or to apply for necessary benefits. We know this can be frustrating given longer than usual wait times or down online systems because of the tremendous volume. To be perfectly clear, no one is going to go without the vital services they need. No one will be left behind. And the women and men on the other end of the line are working tirelessly to help while also worrying about their own families. I ask everyone to please be patient. We know you may need to vent your anxieties and frustrations. We understand that. It's human nature. But we are all in this together. We will all get through this together. And to do that, we all have to be understanding of one another. Before you call, may I make this suggestion? Take a moment again to visit the same website, covid19.nj.gov, covid19.nj.gov, to see if your question can be answered online. In the first 24 hours this site was set up, it was accessed more than 1.6 million times, more than 1.6 million times. It is continually updated. It is there for you all, 9 million members of our New Jersey extraordinary family as a first resource. I want to again give our chief innovation officer and her team, Beth Novak, a big shout out for helping us set that up. Finally, I reiterated where I, I want to reiterate where I started. Unless you are needed as part of our frontline efforts, please stay home. Look, I, I know the numbers that you hear every day are worrying because they're not yet going down and they're going to continue to go up. But let's remember that each number is a fellow New Jerseyan who needs us to rally together behind them and behind each other to flatten the curve and slow the spread of disease. Let's all do our part. And when we do, there is nothing that can defeat us, period, full stop. I mentioned several times over the past number of days, we are at war. And you win wars like World War II, not because you panic, but because you're aggressive, you're smart, you're proactive, you shoot straight with each other. You've got courage. That's what we need right now. We're all in this together. And if each and every one of us does our part from the little things like washing with soap and water for 20 seconds, all the way to the stuff that's painful, staying at home, keeping social distance, we have no choice. If we do all of our parts, we will come through this unequivocally. We will survive and be stronger as one family than ever before. So thank you to each and every one of you. With that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. Um, I also want to welcome Dr. Bresnitz uh, for joining us. Uh, I have to say to the people of New Jersey, I cannot think of a better team than Dr. Bresnitz and Dr. Tan, two nationally recognized epidemiologists, to help guide us through this journey. And I also want to thank all the New Jersey residents who are following our guidance to stay at home. Social distancing, good respiratory etiquette, and hand hygiene are the best tools we have to slow the spread of COVID-19. This effort is vital because it helps us conserve healthcare resources. Our healthcare professionals are making sacrifices every day. They're caring for sick individuals, sick patients, 
and leaving their loved ones at home. So this is our part. This is what we can do. This is what we can do to support them. The goal of social distancing me uh, measures uh, uh, are to reduce the peak numbers of cases and the related demands on the healthcare system. While this effort to reduce peak cases is underway, we are also working to expand hospital capacity and most importantly, uh, to increase the supplies uh, needed to protect our healthcare workers and to take care of our patients. Increasing resources for our hospitals and replenishing supplies to keep our healthcare re uh, workforce safe are definitely our top priorities. We are working around the clock to secure those resources. We know the pressure on the healthcare system will escalate uh, as our cases increase. And that's why we're urging the public to take personal responsibility to reduce the spread of COVID-19 by staying home. As the governor has said repeatedly, we are all in this together. So we must take steps to protect ourselves, our families, and one another. I am sad to report that we have seven new deaths for a total of 27 deaths. And we certainly send our thoughts, prayers, and condolences to the families. The information I have right now, five of those uh, were males, two females, ages 57 to 91. We do know that two of the individuals have pre had pre-existing conditions. One of the individuals was from Warren, one from Somerset, one from Union, two from Bergen, one from Passaic, and one from Essex. One of the individuals uh, was associated with a long-term care facility in New Jersey. As the governor has shared, we have 935 newly reported positive cases. As I've done in the past, I'll go through the counties for you. One in Atlantic, 128 in Bergen, 10 in Burlington, 11 in Camden, 96 in Essex, 5 in Gloucester, 58 in Hudson, 2 in Hunterdon, 10 in Mercer, 61 in Middlesex, 80 in Monmouth, 55 in Morris, 42 in Ocean, 42 in Passaic, 13 in Somerset, 3 in Sussex, 66 in Union, 3 in Warren, and we are still investigating 249 as to the county attribution. It's 935 cases for a total of 2,844 cases in New Jersey. As the governor has said, not surprising, we've expected this and we do expect uh, the uh, increase in cases to continue as we increase uh, the availability of testing. We certainly understand the level of concern about COVID-19 is high in our state. We monitor the calls to our call center uh, and NJ211, and it certainly reflects that. Since opening the call center in, at the end of January, uh, where we have trained healthcare professionals, They've answered over 11,000 calls. NJ211 was launched just last week and has taken more than 3,500 calls. And approximately 100,000 residents have opted uh, to send in texts about COVID-19. We urge you to continue to use these credible sources of information. Visit covid19.nj.gov, which has information on this illness. It has information on employment benefits, educational resources, and more. In closing, as I've done in the past, I encourage and urge all of you to follow the mandates of staying at home. Thank you. Judy, thank you. I realize I did not shut my mic off. I assume yours was working, right? Yeah, I think. Apologies. So just to, uh, tell me if you agree with this, and then I, I've got two quick points before returning to the Attorney General. So not new cases, but total cases, the top five counties far and away, Bergen uh, at number one with 609, if I'm reading this correctly. Number two is Essex County with 273. Number three is now Monmouth with 238. Number four is Middlesex with 210. And five is Hudson with 190. 
I read that right. Secondly, I was, as I was listening to you, as I always do intently, I was uh, uh, staring at the curve uh, that we had asked to, to have back with us. Chris, thank you for bringing it along with you today. I believe this is accurate. The volume, I'm going back to, to, to uh, geometry here, the volume under each of those curves is the same. Right? So this is an important point. We really have two missions here. And again, if I get this wrong, the experts will correct me. Number one, obviously, through the aggressive social distancing, to keep the number of folks who get sick and get the virus as low as we can humanly do it. I know Judy and her team are working on modeling, as she had said over the weekend, and in the next couple of days, we'll have more to report on that. But keeping the, the total number as low as possible. But even in a scenario where you have the same amount of people who get sick, had we not done anything, the key is that blue, that blue reality is one that we can manage as a healthcare system, whereas the red reality is unmanageable. You with me? So even if you have the exact same number of cases, giving us no credit at all for our ability to try to lessen the amount of cases, with the same amount of cases, smoothing that out over time gives our healthcare system number of beds. I mentioned field hospitals. Judy's aggressively with Chris and team trying to, with Pat Callahan, trying to reopen wings of hospitals and complete hospitals that have been shuttered, et cetera, et cetera. Um, assuming that we're able to latch on to the blue reality and not that re red reality, it is manageable. And that's an important point that I felt we should make only because Chris lugged uh, uh, the chart back with him today. So I want to make sure we had uh, not left that gun unsaid. Judy, thank you. I don't know where we would be without you and your team. Extraordinary, extraordinary work. Uh, with that, it is my honor to uh, introduce the guy to my left. I don't know where we'd be without him either, leading the nation in so many fights. Please help me welcome the Attorney General of the great state of New Jersey, Gerbeer Graywall. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for inviting me uh, to, today, to today's briefing, and thank you for your leadership as we work together to meet these unprecedented challenges. Uh, before I speak about the enforcement actions that we're undertaking at the Department of Law and Public Safety, I, too, want to take a moment and recognize all the heroes on the front lines of this war, as the Governor uh, so eloquently put it, uh, our first responders, our nurses, our doctors, and our law enforcement officers. They are putting their health and safety at risk to protect ours. We've got their backs because they have ours. Uh, but our officers and our first responders can't do it alone. And it's time for each and every one of us in this state to do our part to help stop the spread of COVID-19 in New Jersey. And for those who refuse to do their part, let me assure you that there will be serious legal consequences. My office is committing, committed to cracking down on those individuals who refuse to comply in three ways. First, we're pursuing violations of the stay-at-home order. Second, we're going after companies and individuals that illegally price gouge. And third, we're stopping those who are using the, this pandemic as an excuse to justify acts of bias and acts of hate. Let me start with EO 170, excuse me, let me start with EO 107, the stay-at-home order. During this public health emergency, the governor has extensive authority to take bold action to protect the residents of this state against the spread of COVID-19. And he used that authority in issuing EO 107, which shuts down all non-essential retail businesses and requires everyone to stay at home with limited exceptions. Indictable charges. Last week, we established a network of prosecutors across this state in each of our counties who stand ready to give law enforcement officers guidance on how to charge violations of the governor's orders. In addition, we hosted a number of conference calls and virtual meetings with our state's police chiefs and other law enforcement leaders. And I thank the governor for joining the call last Friday. The purpose of these calls was to let our chiefs and law enforcement leaders know that the time for warnings is over and the time to ensure compliance by using all of the tools available to us is here. So if you're a retail store or an entertainment center and you stay open, or if you're a bar and you keep serving patrons in your establishment, consider this as your final warning. Your actions are against the law in New Jersey, and you will be held accountable. The same goes for individuals. If you and your friends decide to throw a party at your home and you invite 20 of your closest friends, stop. Law enforcement officers will have to break that party up, and there will be criminal consequences. 
It's simple. Shut down your non-essential businesses. Stay at home whenever possible. And let's keep everyone safe. This will not only allow our law enforcement agencies to conserve their resources at this time and to focus on critical public safety issues, but it will also avoid putting additional and unnecessary strains on our criminal justice system, our courts, and our jails. At the same time that we are enforcing the governor's EOs, we're continuing to take action to address price gouging related to COVID-19. We know that this is a concern to many people. And to date, our Division of Consumer Affairs has received over 1,400 COVID-19 related complaints concerning some 900 distinct business locations across New Jersey. And let me tell you that our investigators have been on top of this. They're working with our county partners to complete about 350 inspections to date. And we've issued about 160 cease and desist letters and served nearly 30 subpoenas. The complaints that we received included allegations that retailers are unfairly raising prices on surgical masks, on hand sanitizer, on disinfectant sprays and wipes, food, bottled water, and similar items. The good news is that our investigators are finding that only a small percentage of the retailers we receive complaints about may be raising prices inappropriately. In many cases, the price increase we're seeing is being driven by the manufacturer or the wholesaler, not your neighborhood retailer. That's the good news. But the fact that we're not seeing too many egregious cases right now is only a credit to the warnings that we've issued and the inspections that we've done. And it's a credit to the work of our investigators and our local partners. But let me tell you that we have to remain vigilant. Having been a prosecutor for the majority of my career, I will guarantee you, absolutely guarantee you, that additional fraud cases are going to come. Additional cyber frauds are going to come. Additional financial fraud cases are going to come, particularly when federal money start to flow in in the recovery efforts across this state. So we have to remain vigilant, and to do so, we've upgraded the complaint form on our DCA's website, NewJerseyConsumerAffairs.gov. We've done that to ensure that consumers can give us the best information they have so we can conduct our investigations as efficiently as possible. Finally, we're cracking down on bias offenses like we always do. This should go without saying, but unfortunately, it bears repeating right now. COVID-19 is no excuse for intolerance or for hate. There have been disturbing reports from around the country and also in this state of discrimination, of harassment, and even assault against people of East Asian descent. We can't let ignorance or fear of COVID-19 lead to stereotyping and prejudice. COVID-19 has been declared a worldwide pandemic. It doesn't discriminate based on race, race, national origin, or religion. And no one community is more at risk of contracting it or transmitting it. We have zero tolerance here in this state for any kind of discrimination or hate, and we're here to help. If you've been the victim of a hate crime, including one related to COVID-19, contact law enforcement immediately. We're here to protect you now, as always. And if you've faced COVID-19-related discrimination, or harassment in employment, housing, or a place of public accommodation, then reach out to our Division of Civil Rights, which is in my office and available at njcivilrights.gov. I'm certain that there's going to be some questions from the media about the numbers. So let me just say this to begin with, in terms that unfortunately we can all relate to right now. Hate in all of its forms, whether it's discrimination, whether it's bias crimes, is a disease. It's a disease that we have to contain in this moment, like in all moments. So in my mind, even though there are a handful of incidents, that's a handful too many in this state. And let me finish by addressing the order that the governor referred to that Chief Justice Ravner signed late last night. It's a consent order that allows us to initiate a process where offenders who are serving a county jail sentence, which means people who are serving a sentence of a year or less, 364 days or less, will be considered for release. These are individuals, typically, who've been sentenced to county jail as a condition of probation, or they've been sentenced there because of municipal court convictions, or are serving time for fourth-degree offenses, or disorderly persons offenses. Under the process, which is a landmark process that we've established, working with the public defender, working with the Supreme Court, working with other stakeholders, Offenders will be released unless, unless there's an individual-specific objection 
from a county prosecutor or from my office, in which case there will be a hearing on it. If a prosecutor objects, the public defender will have a chance to respond, and a special master will decide the outcome. But to be clear, all of these individuals will have to comply with the same stay-at-home orders that are in effect right now, and they'll have to complete their sentences when our public health emergency concludes. The order also creates a process to ensure that inmates who are being released have a safe place to go and that we connect inmates to the necessary help they need outside of the wall, whether it's medical treatment or shelter or other housing services. We've been in contact with Human Services Commissioner Carol Johnson, who's agreed to help wherever possible so that inmates who need access to these types of services receive them. As I mentioned just a moment ago, I'm a career prosecutor, and I take no pleasure in temporarily releasing or suspending county jail sentences even for the lowest level inmates that are contemplated by today's consent order. But this is the most significant public health crisis we faced in our state's history. And it's forcing us to take actions that we wouldn't consider during normal times. We know and we've seen across the river that jails can be incubators for disease. So we have to take bold and drastic steps. And so when this pandemic concludes, I need to be able to look my daughters in their eyes to say that we took every step possible to help all the residents of this state, including those serving county jail sentences. So I want to thank the 21 county prosecutors who have joined us in this effort. I want to thank the Supreme Court and Chief Justice Ravner for his leadership, the Office of Public Defender, the ACLU, all the other stakeholders who came together in this unprecedented moment to help individuals who are at extreme risk right now behind the wall to get them to a place where we could help flatten the curve and slow the spread of COVID-19. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Gabir. Uh, other than saying, I don't know where we'd be without you and without your leadership, I have two reactions. On the last point, as it relates to the county jail and the, the, the groundbreaking resolution that you've worked out with the Chief Justice, and I want to thank him in absentia as well, uh, ACLU, your own office, the 21 county prosecutors, um, you said it well. We're doing something because we're in uncharted water. And I'm proud of the fact that you've taken that step. Uh, and we are the first step in America, as far as I know, first state in America to have taken that step. So thank you and bless you for that. Secondly, on a slightly less optimistic note, uh, there is a special place in hell for the people who take advantage of this health crisis. Uh, whether you're price, price gouging or you view this as, a, as an excuse uh, to pursue racist or behavior or bullying behavior. Uh, there literally is no time for that in a normal time, and there sure as heck is no time for it uh, in the midst of a war that we're under, and I appreciate enormously the steps you're taking to address that explicitly. Um, the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness has been busy. Uh, it usually is busy uh, in both peacetime and at war. Uh, and in particular, uh, I mentioned earlier that working with the Department of Health and Commissioner uh, Persa Kelly, um, the director uh, is mandating that we get a lot more insight uh, into the comprehensive testing data that's being done, particularly now by our private sector colleagues. And we should give them a shout out, by the way. They've ramped up from zero to doing thousands of these tests overnight. So they, they deserve an enormous amount of credit. But it is important that we get access to the information. And to give you a little bit more color on that, anything else that's on his mind, please help me welcome the, the director of the Department of Homeland Security and Preparedness, Jared Maples. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, at the governor's direction, we are marshalling the full resources of the state of New Jersey to combat this and in, in, in fight this war against COVID-19. As part of that effort, we're constantly trying to sharpen our data to make informed decisions and resource decisions and, and allow the governor to make those as well. Today, I directed all commercial laboratories that are certified to test for COVID-19 to report their data, test data, every day to the Department of Health. It will allow the Department of Health and indeed the entire government in New Jersey and our citizens to make informed decisions and gain the best data possible to make resource, to have resource managed, uh, et cetera. As we continue to adapt and focus our risk mitigation strategies, this data will only help us get through this effort, as the governor has mentioned often, as a stronger New Jersey. With that, I'd lead back to the governor. Jared, thank you. 
Judy and I were doing an offline, but we were, I promise you, we were paying attention. So uh, thank you for that leadership. Um, so uh, Pat Callahan, uh, Chris Newworth, Dr. Christina Tan, are, are, as usual, are with us uh, to answer the tough questions while not having a speaking role per se. I am certain that we'll get to each of the three of you, uh, as well as Dr. potentially to Dr. Bresnitz, uh, Bresnitz as well. Uh, let's start here. We'll go to some questions and answers. Ask one is uh, back with the blue glove and the microphone. Governor, you today have mentioned a lot about social distancing, as you have for several days. The importance of this you, has been you know, talked about over and over and over. Um, over the weekend, going to different stores, I noticed um, some larger stores are doing absolutely nothing with regard to counting people going in. I know we've done away with the 50 limit, but we're still trying to keep it very low. No gatherings, obviously. Um, some other stores that are smaller, that are food stores, are um, giving people hand um sanitizing lotion as they go in, they are wiping down carts, and then other stores are cleaning belts for each customer as they hit the checkout counter, but they're still not implementing any uh, specific uh, limits on how many people can go in the store. Do you have any specific directives, and do you feel it's important? Because I think there's a lot of confusion, and it's like right now, it's just yep. up to whatever they think they yep. might or could or should yep. be doing. What should they be doing? What should we try to be in doing? And is there a question about enforcing this? Do we have enough police to check on supermarkets? Yep. Listen, uh, let, me, let me do my best to address some of this, and I may ask my colleagues to come in. Um, I'm also fresh, as, as I think I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, off a call with the executive board of the New Jersey's AFL-CIO, and that includes a lot of retail worker representatives, and this, this in fact, came up as a discussion point. Uh, and my advice, not just on that call, but my advice to our retail brothers and sisters has been from the get-go, particularly to the folks literally who are at the front line, to be uh, excessive in their wiping down with the right um, – with the right quality uh, cloth, uh, the, the surfaces around them, including the belts, exercising extreme uh, hand hygiene and, and finding some way to keep distance uh, from each other. Um, as, a, as a general matter, we have said there, there's a list of essential and non-essential. Uh, th that's what the world's broken down into. Uh, and so I'm going to focus on the essential side because those are the, that's the, those are the places that are open, as you rightfully point out. We expect uh, nothing less than not just good hygiene, but social distancing going on inside those locations. Just because they're open uh, does not mean that it's a free-for-all. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that, you know, it's early days, so this is now only three days into this, and there is uneven behavior, uh, but we must reiterate that the, that, that the behavior is mandated. It has to be. That's everything from probably restricting the amount of people who are physically in the place and, importantly, how far they are from each other. I'll ask the Attorney General to weigh in, but let me just say this um, uh, as a non-law enforcement uh, official, uh, and that is um, if we extend our enforcement capabilities to every corner of the state, there will still be some corners that we can't get to inside of people's houses uh, is the obvious uh, example, uh, including inside of even, in some cases, essential businesses. That's not to say that we're not going to necessarily spot check, but it is certainly to say that we expect a level of behavior. Look at the Italian uh, example. Look at what they're living through. I think, thank God, overnight cases and fatalities are finally down today versus yesterday, and I hope that's the beginning of a trend, but there was too much business as usual. And so I've said this many times, just as, it, just as it is not a time to panic, it is just as importantly not a time for business as usual. Grabeer, do you want to add anything to that? You know, I, I said in my remarks, I, I wish we didn't have to talk about penalties and consequences and that people would take the personal responsibility. We don't have unlimited resources on good days, and we certainly don't have unlimited resources today when you have law enforcement agencies trying to balance shifts. So in case they do have employees that are infected, it doesn't spread to a larger number of individuals who are on that force. So 
They're, sh they're shifting resources and priorities, so we need public cooperation. And then we're going to prioritize, as we always do. If we see and receive complaints about large private gatherings or if we receive and see uh, non-essential businesses functioning when they're not supposed to, those are clear-cut cases, and we're going to start our enforcement efforts uh, in those places. If I may just quickly follow, Governor. Um, specifically, though, I mean, if it's a store that normally holds 500 people, should they have 50 a store that normally has 50 people, should they have 10? I mean, is there any way that we can start to do this or not? I would, I would say this. We, we dropped our gatherings from infinity to 250 to 50 to zero. Uh, so that should be where we start. Uh, and, and I think these stores have to, and by the way, for the most part, they get it and they're doing this. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, they've got to it, it aggressively manage the amount of people in the building and the amount of distance in particular people have from each other in the building. A, 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 room, a store this size versus one that's 10 times this size obviously has a different dynamic. May I say something else on law enforcement? Uh, law enforcement members, first responders, just like healthcare workers, are not immune uh, to the challenges that, that face us. Pat and I were back and forth yesterday about a, a police officer in the state who's, you know, who's got the, the virus and is, was up against it. And God willing, I hope doing a little bit better uh, today based on what we heard overnight. Um, and so n not only do we have the best in the nation in terms of first responders, law enforcement, fire, EMTs, and certainly healthcare workers, uh, but we only have so many of them. Uh, and these folks are indispensable, and we've got to make sure we're caring for their health as well. Dr. Tan, anything you'd add in terms of the, um, the, the, the general question? Then we're going to move over to Matt here, ask one. Yeah, just to echo all the comments is that, um, you know, we have to make sure that there's also concurrent to what we're seeing with the increase in cases, that there's also an outbreak of common sense as far as um, what um, uh, grocery stores and uh, others might need to implement to keep in mind all the social distancing uh, guidance that has been put forth by uh, the governor as well as all of our other agencies. You know, threshold numbers um, are helpful guides for um, uh, most uh, businesses uh, and uh, grocery stores in general, but again, outbreak of common sense about how to implement that. I love that. Thank you. Matt. Governor, yes. Uh, with um, uh, more than 2,000 cases, have we reached the point where uh, contract tracing has stopped? Uh, if it's still being done, to what extent is it happening and why is it still important? And at what time would that effort effectively cease? Let me just say this. Uh, sadly, Matt, what you said uh, we've got 2,000. In fact, we've almost got 3,000 uh, in, in those numbers. As we said, listen, we expected this. this, did, this is not, we, we're not having a holy cow moment here that, oh, my Lord, these numbers have uh, exploded and we weren't expecting this. We knew this would happen, particularly as we expanded uh, the testing regime. And that's even prior to getting the full modeling um, uh, returns that Judy and her team are working on. Uh, so good question. Judy, do you want to do you want to hit this or Dr. Tan? Let's go to Dr. Tan again. Yeah, as we've been mentioning for the last several weeks, you know, we know that the, um, you know, it's a continuum of containment and um, community mitigation efforts. And, you know, there's no on-off switch as far as, okay, when contact tracing will stop versus, you know, when we implement all these community mitigation efforts that um, try to promote social distancing. Um, we are seeing, for example, in our state that, you know, there are uh, fewer cases in certain areas of our state, like the southern areas, where the contact tracing might be more reasonably achieved um, where containment measures such as the contact tracing and the more aggressive um, uh, tracing related to that might be effective. But, you know, as we've started to see in um, our northeastern area um, uh, moving uh, southward and westward, there's been more of that shift toward um, uh, trying as best as possible with the local resources to um, do as best as pop possible identifying contacts. But again, the same um, strategies as far as community mitigation still would remain the same. The social distancing, um, uh, the other efforts that have been employed already um, in the state. You make a, a fair point. There are still four counties with single-digit cases. The reality to your question, Matt, may be very different there than a Bergen where you've got over 600 cases. Thank you. Elise. Uh, two questions. Could you get a little closer there, ask one with the mic? Yes, Thank two you. questions. Yep. Pot uh, potentially, how many county 
um, inmates would be released. Also, you signed an executive order um, mandating that testing centers report their figures to the state. It was my understanding that they were doing that all along. So what was uh, the need for this mandate? Yeah, so I would just say on the second one, but I want to have the health folks uh, and, and Jared address that. Uh, it wasn't that it wasn't that they're not doing a good job. In fact, the, the scale, I think this was spoken, we, Bill Hass of Lab, Lab Corp, I think it was Friday, we were at, at Bergen Community College. He said they were up to 20,000 tests batching overnight. I said, uh, where were you two weeks ago? And he said they were still working on uh, developing the actual test two weeks ago. So this is not a this is not a look at a gift horse in the mouth, as they say. We thank them, uh, but the fact of the matter is, I think we've said this at every one of our gatherings. There's been a gap uh, in our knowledge of what we can control and oversee directly at the Department of Health versus uh, both in timing and in 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 uh, depth of information that we get from these entities. Uh, but let me uh, actually let's stay with that for a second. Any any of the health side want to add to the uh, the the, the um, what, what we're getting, what we hope to get now that we weren't getting before. Yeah, actually, um, to your point, um, the Department of Health has been, um, you know, by uh, our regulations, we're supposed to be getting all the positive results. And actually, many of our commercial laboratories, um, the largest um, volume uh, uh, commercial laboratories, have also been providing the negative results. We have over 60 um, commercial laboratories that are uh, providing us results. It's a matter of um, just kind of compiling all that information and getting this uh, in a more uh, systemic way. That's what, that's what we're aiming toward, uh, getting that more complete data at this point. We, we think, it's fair to say, folks, we think from moment one, knowing what the total denominator is, the total positives and the total negatives, uh, is not just good for our ability to manage this, this, this challenge, but that gives, I think, folks, you know, in our job of trying to lessen anxiety, I think that's a step toward lessening anxiety. Jared, your name was on that letter. Any any particular insight as to why you're uh, particularly associated with this? Yeah, I would. One bit of clarification: you mentioned executive order is actually a directive uh, from me in my role as director or the chair of the Domestic Security Preparedness Task Force. So it's a directive to compel those laboratories to re report the full results. It becomes a homeland security concern to make sure we have the full data picture as we again marshal all of our resources across the state of New Jersey and advise the governor in his role in allocating those resources. And, of course, Commissioner Persichilli uh, in prosecuting her duty as the Commissioner of Health. And so it really becomes about getting the full picture in a timely manner, in an accurate manner. That's really the end result. Uh, General, to Lisa's first question, how, many, how big a population is this in the county in uh, jails? So that, that work is ongoing. We're getting lists of those inmates who fall into the categories that I outlined. And our prosecutors across the state are now trying to strike that difficult balance of public safety, public health, the rights of crime victims to see which we're going to object to and which we're going to consent to of those inmates who fall into those categories. Our objections across the state are due by 5 p.m., I believe, today. And so we'll know at that point how many we consent to. Then it would be a question of lining up services for those who need them, whether they're on medication-assisted treatment behind the wall. We don't want that to slip. We don't want to trade one issue for another, so we are very mindful of all those issues, so we'll take the time that's needed to line up all those services as well. So we'll know better by the end of the day and a little bit better tomorrow after the hearings that will take place on the objections. So when we do get the information, we'll promise either the, the general will be with us or I will or somehow we'll get that information out. We'll, we'll push it out. Yeah, thank you. A couple education questions. Shocked um, by that. I'm shocked. I know. You're surprised. Uh, you said that schools would likely at this point be, have an, be closed for an extended period. Are we talking at this point close to the, you know, closing for the rest of the school year? That's only really two and a half months at this point. Yeah. Yet to be determined, but longer than, than not is and, our guess. And, and testing, has, you said same, you might have same, a decision same on answer that. And I, I know we owe you an answer on that. Uh, and we are, again, we've got a, a, a group of folks who are trying to understand the federal directive that came out at the end of the week, as well as our own reality. We know we owe you an answer, um, uh, but we, we're not, not there me. yet. Not just me. I think others. What's that? Not just me. No, no, I know yeah. that. No, yeah. no, no. I, 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 the, the broad you. The, the, you, the you is in the 9 million 
members of the New Jersey family. And, and just last question on education. Uh, a group of uh, advocacy groups today called for an education task force to be formed to keep an eye on, on this process as we go forward, especially concerned about loss of learning for special needs students, um, but, but all students for that matter. Would you consider something like that? So I hadn't seen that. Um, I would want to first go to the commissioner of the Department of Education. Uh, we've got a state board of education. I want to go to the professionals who are currently working on this. I don't begrudge, uh, just he hearing it for the first time, I don't begrudge that interest because I think it's something that we're all keenly interested in. I've got four kids myself who are all doing remote learning right now. Uh, and you want to make sure that, you know, we're the number one public education system in America. We're there for a reason. Uh, that has a lot to do with the model that we have prosecuted for decades, if not uh, centuries. Uh, we want to keep it that way. So to, to, I'll come back to you se separately. Do you have one, sir? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, it's a question about constitutional rights. You had a long list of businesses that are exempt from the uh, closures, but you didn't exempt self-defense centers, gun stores, FFLs, um, and gun ranges. Um, your bill, your executive order specifically says that people that are low income will be protected against any type of essential services. Why do you believe that a liquor store which you exempt and home improvement stores that you exempt are more important than a place where somebody can acquire tools to protect themselves? One specific woman came, went public, a low-income African-American woman, saying one, woman to, one woman's message to politicians, don't leave me def defenseless now. Um, my second question is to Mr. Callaghan. Would you use your authority in the executive order to make an exception for gun stores, make the Knicks background check go live again because currently it's down because of the executive order so that thousands and tens of thousands of residents can be able to protect themselves? You know, just as you're about to ask your question, I was about to say, you know, you, you don't normally only show up at gun events. So I could have predicted this is... Uh, you, you, got, you got time on your hands, obviously. Um, Listen, we, we made the, the call on essential versus non-essential. The, the attorney general I'll, is I'll welcome to weigh in on, on, on that as well as the, as well as the, the, the colonel. Uh, I'm comfortable where we landed, uh, and I'll ask the attorney general to give you a little bit more color. Yeah, I, I would just – there's a lawsuit, as you probably know, that's been filed on this very topic today, so I, I won't comment on the litigation, and, and we're not going to comment on more specifics right now until we review the lawsuit, and we'll – respond accordingly in court, but I will say that the governor's uh, executive order tracks every other executive order uh, that, that has a stay-at-home provision, and none of those, none of those contain an exemption for firearm stores, and, and nor does the federal guidance from Homeland Security contain that type of exemption when it comes to essential facilities and non-essential facilities. So we're consistent with every other executive, uh, stay -at -home, executive order that calls for stay-at-home, uh, and we're consistent with federal guidelines, and we'll defend the governor's executive order in court. Pat, anything you want to add? The only thing I'll add is I've fielded several emails, uh, phone calls over the past several days with regard to that very issue. Uh, and to the governor's and attorney general's point, in consultation with the governor's chief counsel and the attorney general, uh, those stores at this juncture are deemed non-essential, and that was my response. Thank you. Ma'am. John, uh, get you. I apologize. Question for Corporal Callahan. Um, we, Governor Murphy, briefly mentioned the recruit who pe tested positive over the weekend, resulting in a number of uh, team members who are now quarantined. Uh, how is all this uh, affecting the way state police do their? Wh what do you guys do different? And is any of that trickling down? Has there been any directive to local departments on how officers are to do things differently to protect themselves and therefore protect everybody else? With regards to the first part of that question, in, in the training academy, uh, myself, the attorney general, Commissioner Persa Kelly, uh, struggled daily with that decision. Uh, and I'll give you some insight. Last Sunday, we put in a process uh, to basically check in with the recruits. And one said Sunday afternoon, gave a few symptoms. We told that recruit to stay home. Uh, we had canceled uh, physical training, swimming. We had tried to do all the mitigation strategies and social distancing within the academy and did. 
uh, on Thursday afternoon, that, in the afternoon, that recruit that was home tested positive, and I happened to be sitting right across the table from the commissioner at the time, uh, and in concert with her guidance and counsel, as well as the attorney generals, we decided to send all of those recruits home, and it was 196. And as, as, as much as I want to deem them essential uh, to protect those that will ultimately protect us, it was not an easy decision. They all went home with a laptop and will be doing, to the extent that they can, all of the blocks of instruction, just like we're asking our students and, and college students to do, remotely. Uh, difficult decision. They are, uh, at this juncture, our goal is to have them come back on April 6th. That would fit the 14-day uh, window of uh, it was a difficult decision because we thought them being housed and together at Seeger helped us in some way because then we send them home on the weekends and it becomes that back and forth and balance of what mitigation we could have done there. So very, very difficult. And as far as our troopers, to the Attorney General's point, uh, there will be no different level of service or impact to response times, but we have... Uh, in order to preserve and make sure there is a quote unquote bullpen of troopers, we have uh, split up our squads to have uh, same amount of troopers there, but on the road, meeting the minimum staffing requirement, but making sure that if a whole squad goes down or perhaps a station, that between the troopers assigned to field operations, as well as all the other response of the troopers in the admin section, investigations, that we have that cadre of troopers to make sure that we don't skip one beat. Because when somebody calls 911, as I said to the police chiefs the other day, somebody's got to respond to those calls and that level of service will remain the same. We just need to be smart about our scheduling. Thank you for that, Chad. You've talked a lot today about the need for data to make better decisions for the public to be assured of these things. And the denominator, can you tell us today the total number of testing? And if not, at some point, will these briefings include the number of total tests? And as on that number of hospitalizations, can you tell us the number of actual people tested for, who are positive for COVID-19 hospitalized? And does the Department of Health have a dashboard of sorts like the private health systems do to know the number of occupied hospital beds in total, the number of occupied ICU beds, in order for you to know what hospitals will be stressed and not stressed? And can you give us an update on the ventilator acquisitions? So uh, the, Judy and team will give you all the above. I would just say as a general matter, the data, you're absolutely right. The more data we have at our, uh, at our ready that's available to us, the better informed we are to make the right decisions. Uh, there's no question about that. I think what you're going to need, I'm going to give you the non-health experts answer here. We're going to need the order that both Judy and Jared signed today to actually take effect uh, in order to really effectively address the first question you asked, how many positives, how many negatives, what's the denominator? That's something we obviously want to have at our disposal, as you can imagine. I think you're going to have to bear with us a little bit for that to take, take effect. I think that's our expectation. Um, Please correct that record, Judy, and please address the hospitalization and the ventilator <clears throat> question if you could. Thank you. You're certainly right on the first account. On the hospitalizations, we are working with the hospital association and all of the hospitals uh, to um, populate our predictive uh, modeling uh, algorithm. Uh, there's some information that is still outstanding, for example, not only how many patients you have in your critical care units, but what their average length of stay is for us to be able to project out. I can tell you as of Friday evening, um, there are about 600 patients in our hospitals in New Jersey that are considered persons under investigation. So they're waiting for their test results to return. And we have another 100 that have uh, positive uh, results uh, on the record. Um, that's the latest I, I have. Uh, we have a five o'clock call uh, with the hospital association this afternoon to start getting uh, more regular data. So if that gives you some indication of what our hospitals are dealing with, I don't have the critical care numbers. Um, you, know, you know, patients move back and forth. They get admitted to a medical surgical bed depending on their condition, they may go to an ICU bed for a number of days, then they go back to a step down and then med surge and then uh, discharge to either home care rehab or, so it's, it's a process, but they're, they're the statistics I have right now. 
Judy, what about ventilators? <clears throat> we have a total inventory of ventilators. Well, let me start with the number of critical care beds. We have almost 2,000 critical care beds uh, in our hospitals. We have an inventory of 1,700 ventilators. Not all of them are in use at this time. Uh, we do believe for every critical care bed, there should be a one-to-one -one ratio ventilator to critical care bed. Uh, so looking at our full inventory and our number of beds, we um, have a deficit of about 300. We've asked uh, uh, the um, HHS for 400 ventilators because you should always have ventilators on standby. That will just cover our existing licensed critical care beds. We do expect with a surge that we will have to increase our volume of critical care beds and therefore increase our requirement for ventilators. That's still under um, review. Thank you for that. Can we very quickly, just because we have to go back to the, uh, connect with the White House. John, you, you okay? You, real quick. To follow up on that, how, are you, how is the Department of Health able to track the timing of the surge without all that data? And Governor, on a quick budget, are you, I heard you're meeting with the treasurer and legislative leaders. Where do you stand in terms of revenues, particularly sales tax and the casino revenues and things coming in, uh, in terms of the budget and possibly going forward? The, uh, the um, algorithm that we're using, it's populated by the data that we do have. I think I shared that the average length of stay in ICU and the average length of stay in the hospital is still outstanding. Um, I don't know, Dr. Bresnitz is my, uh, has been our, our key individual looking, working with the team on the algorithms. Uh, do you have anything you want to add? Just that we've reached out to um folks, well, one person in particular, to try to give an estimate based on um, their experience in their hospital, what the average length of stay is for those who are hospitalized but not in an ICU and what it is for those who have unfortunately been in an ICU. That information will impact on the modeling of what the surge capacity will be. So, for example, if the uh, average length of stay is lower, then that makes more beds available over a period of time. If the average length of stay is longer, then it decreases the capacity to, to basically handle any uh, excess number of cases. And that is an important element in the model. And ho Thanks, ho Dr. hopefully Bruce. we'll have that today. Thank you. Real quick, I don't have a crisp answer for you. We do have a leadership meeting. Uh, as I said, we've got a video call with the president and vice president, and then we'll get a leadership meeting after that. But the impact is significant would be a word I would use, uh, material, meaningful, large. It's, this is a big deal, which is why we need, uh, that's why we need so desperately the federal back and fill direct cash assistance. Anything back here? You good? Real quick. Um, your meetings last week with the Army Corps of Engineers. Are there any possible sites that could potentially be used to house patients that, that could be started to be worked on in the near future? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. We're in intense uh, engagement with them. You just you went off there. Yeah. We're looking at the full continuum, uh, the life, the continuum life cycle of a patient, and we do expect that patients that would maybe um, be acceptable for a medical surgical bed, we might be opening up med surge beds in hotels uh, and have them uh, um, appropriately cared for. Uh, with all of the supplies. So we're looking at the whole continuum so that the patients in New Jersey will be taken care of at the same level of care. It just may be a, a different venue. Here's two quick things on that. Number one, I think you've heard the word displace before. So you might be taking patients who are in category X and putting them over here to then have available space for category Y in this particular facility. Secondly, while the, if I say this wrong, please correct me. It, it, while the population is larger in the north, and unfortunately the population impacted by the virus is larger in the north, we started before this virus hit. Uh, while the population may be smaller and the infection rate may be less at the moment in the south, we entered this with a mismatch in the south between critical care beds and the population to begin with, which is why that's a particular point of focus of Judy and her team. Please, real quick. 
prison, I still don't have an answer on assessments uh, no, okay. in the life of the school um, year, by the way. A prison question for a colleague at Spotlight. Have there been any ca positive cases at all in the prisons, either uh, inmates or staff? And is there more that can be done in terms of restrictions on people coming in and out of the prisons? Well, they've already restricted. The commissioner of the Department of Corrections has already uh, made significant restrictions. Whether or not he's prepared or will go further, I don't know. How about cases inside of the system? I, I can just share with you at the state level, we have not had any cases to date. I, I'm not level? at the county, I don't know. I don't know this, but I want to reiterate what we're doing is, uh, is the, we're, we're the only state in America doing this. So, Elise, I'll come back to you, Matt. Elise, I think you're good. Um, with regard to your call with the president, who initiated the call? How long did you speak? Uh, why was the call taking place? Um, and did you tell him that you're appealing to citizens for PPE? Uh, uh, so I want to give a shout out where credit is due here. We put a request in for a call this morning and he called me back this morning. So that, uh, that I, I, I have to say that tur turnaround when you talk about the president of the United States is, is meaningful. Secondly, Elise, we uh, spoke about, he, first of all, he knows New Jersey well, uh, so we talked a little bit about New Jersey. Um, the call was probably in the five to ten minute range. I raised with him, I said, Mr. President, he, he said, what's on your mind? I said, the three big asks continue to be PPE. Uh, we need a big bucket of federal money, and we need to stand up as soon as possible in this case, really, FEMA Region 2, but I know the Army Corps is involved, uh, four field hospitals, just having gotten off the phone with Judy not 10 minutes before that, so I had the right, uh, I had the right uh, ask. Uh, and he said, I, I, on, the, on the federal, uh, on the congressional support for direct aid to states, he said, I, I don't know where this is going to turn out, but I understand that's something that's important to both sides of the aisle. He talked for a minute about some of these malaria drugs that he is very focused on and that they, he, he believes can change people's outcomes, uh, even those who are very sick. I'm not a health expert, so um, I, I, I don't have an opinion on that. Um, and uh, PPE was sort of more of a reiteration. I'm, I'm not sure I walked away with the call with anything specific on PPE. In fact, I know I didn't, uh, but there was a very specific discussion about the field hospitals, and we pursued that immediately. Matt. Another from a colleague. I'll try to speed through this one here for you. But uh, we had a story today following uh, your comments yesterday about Prudential donating 153,000 masks and respirators to the state. Uh, could you also tell us if any other companies have similarly stepped up with any assistance? And uh, what does Prudential's donation mean for New Jersey? And how does the state intend to distribute, distribute those items? Because several hospitals have called us directly asking how they can get some of those supplies. Going to give you a general answer, and then I'm going to ask you, Pat, to give to give you the specifics um, on Prudential. And I, I called its CEO and, and or texted him and thanked him immediately, and he was very gracious in his reply. Prudential's on a list of really good corporate citizens who are stepping up at this crisis, and we need that to continue to happen. Um, just think of the following. Think of if I get this wrong, anybody up here, please come in and uh, correct me. Think of the PPE process as going from a series of uh, parallel inputs and then a series of parallel outputs, Pat in particular. Uh, this is now, Chris, this is now being funneled in to one input point and one coordinated output point. So we've now gone to an hourglass. Is that fair to say on its side? Um, so uh, Pat can comment on Prudential uh, in a second, although when folks say, uh, we have to respect this. Uh, th this is what we're prepared to do, and we we would ask you to pay particular attention to healthcare institution X because it happens to be in their town. We're, we're not going to ignore that as a as a point. We we may have a reaction to it, um, but others. Goldman Sachs, by the way, I'm not sure where where or why and or, or how much, but I want to give them credit uh, for for making uh, that uh, offer today. George Helmy, as we as I walked in here, was following up with them. Home Depot, I, I gave a shout out to already. Um, and those are the three that I know particularly come to mind. We've got a lot of folks who are, are coming up with good ideas and potential places in particular to buy PPE. Uh, but again, we, we could use as many 
donations as possible, and that's PPE donations at njsp.org. <laughs> Pat, any more color on Prudential? Uh, Prudential, it was really amazing. I got that phone call at about 10 o'clock yesterday morning, and by yesterday afternoon, we had all the masks, hand sanitizers, gloves uh, picked up by troopers and stored in a location in North Jersey. Uh, University Hospital received a portion of that last night. That's how quickly that came together. We then, working in conjunction with health, we have all of the hospitals in the state of New Jersey, and we had to make the decision about, based upon uh, what we were seeing across the state, how we were going to most appropriately prioritize the distribution of that. It is like the triaging of this PPE. Um, on another note, just this afternoon, uh, I had the Attorney General's Office assist in drafting a letter that was went out today through the Commissioner of Education to all uh, school districts, public school districts, uh, knowing that they have a lot of PPE in their schools and the schools are closed. So we're not asking for it all, but knowing that that PPE that they purchased in the wake of Ebola is sitting there, uh, this isn't, as the Gov says, all hands on deck, pull out all the stops, and if 600 plus school districts can step up, um, I requested it. I would think I do have the authority to mandate it. That's not where we want to be. I think every school district in the state of New Jersey wants to pitch in, uh, and primarily this is going to be for health care. This is about keeping the hospitals open. Uh, first responders are a close second, but I think it's our, our doctors and, nur and nurses and those folks in the hospitals that we got to make sure that they're protected. So Gov said Home Depot, that email address that he gave out, that's for anybody, any uh, pub private, public, anybody who wants to donate it. We have a private sector desk set up at the SEOC, Phenomenal Partners, and we have that email. We'll go to our donations management folks, uh, and we will make sure that we have that full inventory, and based upon the priority uh, hospitals, that's where it's going to go to. Again, that's uh, PPE donations at njsp.org. At least one other point I made to the president, and I made this to, to uh, him on vi by video at the end of the week, and I, this is a quote on, on, your, on my behalf. I know that the Lord helps those that help themselves. So I wanted to make sure that, that uh, nobody thinks New Jersey's sitting back with their feet up, uh, not doing everything we can to, to track and source PPE. Uh, the folks up at this table and all their colleagues are literally turning over every stone. So it's a little bit like our Community College Opportunity Grant. That's a last dollar program. The student has to exhaust and prove they've exhausted all the other avenues before they get to get that grant. Uh, that's the mindset that we're having with the federal government. Uh, our ask is big, but I want to make sure that the president knows himself and his team knows it's big, but it's legitimate. And it envisions uh, aggressive behavior across the whole spectrum of uh, channels available to us. We're going to end here if we could, please. Yes. Um, AG, um, question for you with regard to um, releasing certain low-level prisoners. How does this impact who police are now going to arrest, take into custody, what kinds of crimes and so forth, if at all? And related question, Governor, for you. Um, we got Easter coming up. You see families going out for walks, for bike rides. They're probably figuring, well, you know, if we have a family gathering and, you know, we can invite the aunt and uncle, what's the big deal there? Um, regard to some guidance on that from you. Sure, Gov. Um, we, there was a question earlier about guidance to law enforcement. We issued guidance last Monday about exercising discretion. And this is not to say that if there's an imminent public safety threat to ignore it, certainly we're going to respond to those cases. But if there are cases that we can wait and charge later, the old check fraud case that's been sitting around for a month, the old financial fraud case that hasn't moved for months, there's not a reason to charge that right now when we're in the midst of this pandemic. We've also told them to increasingly use complaint summonses over complaint warrants. A complaint warrant brings somebody into the jail system. A complaint summons gives them a date, a future date in which to appear in court. So those are two steps we've taken, and we've encouraged them to exercise their discretion. And certainly, we're releasing folks who are serving less than a year sentence. In some cases, they're to be released in a matter of weeks, uh, if not months. But we're also mindful. We're not 
calling for the release of those who we've detained pre-trial, who we, we've argued are dangerous to the public or flight risks. These are people who will assess their dangerousness to themselves and to others before we consent to their release, but it's a common sense approach that we have to take right now. Sadly, I wish I had a more upbeat answer, and God knows, I hope by the time April 12th throws, rolls around, that we're in a dramatically different and better place. Uh, but with both Easter and Passover coming up to pick at least two big religious holidays and religious seasons, really, when you factor in the days of Passover and the Holy Week, um, we, we, we can't allow to, to let happen what your question implied. If you look at the, the blessed Fusco family who had a family gathering a couple of Sundays ago and literally f multiple fatalities and sicknesses that have come out of that. Um, I'd I, don't, I don't want to be the Grinch. I guess I don't know what the, uh, the, uh, the equivalent of the Grinch is for Easter or Passover, but we're going to have to, we're going to have to enforce the social distancing stuff that we're talking about. I don't, I don't, that brings me no joy to say that again, if we get to Holy week, if we get to Passover and we're in a different place, I'll be the happiest guy in New Jersey. Um, we're going to sh shut down again and forgive me because we've got to get, um, over to the rock. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Mahan, the next couple of days, both at 2 o'clock and both in Newark, uh, at Rutgers, Newark. Is that right? One more time. Tomorrow, at Rutgers, Newark. Uh, Wednesday, as I mentioned, at Trenton, back here at the War Memorial. All right. Okay, I apologize. I want to thank Dr. Bresnitz for coming out um, out of the bullpen to help us out. Big deal, sir. Thank you to have. Thank you for coming back, uh, uh, putting the band back together. Uh, Dr. Tan, to, to you uh, as well. Chris, thank you. Judy, I don't know where it would be without you and your whole team, so thank you. Likewise, Mr. Attorney General, uh, Director, Colonel, to each and every one of you. God bless you. Thank you. Stay safe. See you soon.